welcome Dr. Nikki A. Green, who is an amazing professor of art history at Wellesley College. She's an assistant professor and uh, someone whose career I followed from, I'm going to say, nearly the beginning. Um, and uh, Dr. Green and I had the great pleasure uh, most recently about a year ago uh, working together on a symposium at the Clark Art Institute um, where she did her MA um, on the object of performance with Dorothy Moss who is a, the curator of performance sculpture and painting at the National um, Portrait Gallery in Washington DC. And I know that there's students from our program who also participated in that. So I just wanted to mention that, that the connections that we have um, are longstanding. And, um, and this uh, upcoming year, as it's already been announced, uh, Dr. Green is an advisor to um, the commission of Simone Lee uh, to represent the US at the Venice Biennial um, in 2022. And, um, and so we're really excited to know about, about that uh, collaboration as well and look forward to working with her as a program uh, to realize that um, exhibition. But I wanted to just give a, a little bit more of a sort of standard bio uh, for Dr. Green. And I think there are a lot of really interesting points to, to your pathway, Dr. Green, that will be um, exciting for our students to learn about. So Dr. Green received um, her BA with honors in art history from Wesleyan University. She hails from Newark, New Jersey, one of the most amazing cities um, in the country and definitely the most amazing city in the state of New Jersey. Um, and her master's and PhD she received from the University of Delaware. And uh, Dr. Green, I want you to know that earlier this week we had a visit from the University of Delaware. They did a really nice uh, presentation on their program um, in okay. art history. And so uh, as part of Career Week, we're not only having these conversations with leading scholars like yourself, but we're also, um, we've invited representatives from a number of different schools to present their programs so that students can see where they might envision themselves in, in, the, in the future. I love, it. I love it. Yeah. And so Dr. Green's work uh, examines African-American and African diasporic identities, the body, feminism, abstraction and music in modern and contemporary art. And I'm gonna pause here too from her bio just to say that it's really, um, I think, just exciting and also transformational the way that you position your work as an art historian. That is to say that um, it's not gonna be sort of your standard art history textbook, uh, the way that you teach or the way that you write, the way that you imagine your work even when you do curatorial work, rather to be able to think about art history sonically, um, to think about the image sonically is something that, um, that your work um, has been very much distinguished by. She's also the visual arts editor for Transition Magazine, which is a really important um, journal that comes out of the Hutchins Center for African and African American uh, Research at Harvard University. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm mentioning this too, because I know that among our students here on the call, many of them are accomplished writers and um, who knows uh, what the next issue is gonna be about, but um, it'll be exciting to follow what you're doing with that, Dr. Green. Um, and I just also wanted to mention too, that in terms of her, her breadth, um, her, her work has been shared in scholarly um, um, settings, whether it's at, say, you know, the College Art Association or other gatherings like Black Portraitures globally and also in the U.S. Um, and she has an amazing and exciting book that's going to be published by Duke University Press imminently in 2021. It's called Grime, Glitter, and Glass, The Body and the Sonic in Contemporary Black Art. Um, and it's a book that looks at the work of artists such as Renee Stout, Maria Magdalena Campos Palms, and Radcliffe Bailey, uh, who hails from our Atlanta. And it, in, it, it considers the intersection between the body, black identity, and the sonic possibilities of the visual using key examples of painting, sculpture, photography, performance, and installation. Um, Dr. Green has also been the recipient of numerous grants and awards um, and including um, 
uh, being shortlisted for the Creative Capital Warhol Ar Arts Writers Grant in 2018 and 2019. So um, I think without further ado, I'm going to say, um, please join us and welcome Dr. Green. We're really excited to hear about your pathway to art history. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be included in what has been a fantastic week of um, presentations and um, I have so much admiration for Cheryl as a, um, as you all have discovered, the, the world of black art historians is still relatively small. We all know each other one way or another, but Cheryl and I have interacted um, both professionally and personally um, from Johannesburg to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and so um, I'm excited to be a part of this. And also I, I would be remiss if I don't mention the fact that she's also a proud Wellesley College graduate. And so, right, proud, yes. Okay, good. Yes. Um, I feel like I'm a part, even though I didn't attend as an undergraduate, um, being a part of the Wellesley College community, it's, it's really wonderful to see Cheryl um, be there in Atlanta with you all. Um, and I have so many Spelman friends, um, proud Spelman grad friends. And so this is a really wonderful space for me to occupy. And I am also very much looking forward to the partnerships that will be taking place with the art collective um, as we look to Venice in just a couple of years. Um, year and a half, 18 months, who's counting? Exactly. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> and um, what I'll do today, I will give you a kind of overview from, from Newark to um, the Biennale. Probably the one thing that I forgot, one slide I forgot to put in is the Biennale, but I'm excited to share my life story with you all. Um, in 30 minutes. And so um, I don't know how many of you uh, hail from large cities in uh, across the country. And, um, and for me being raised in a predominantly black and brown city, it had such an, an immediate impact on my life. I never imagined how much Newark would inform who I am today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you all and so um, as you all know I am um, sort of very proud of, of my, my um, career as an art historian. I think what's interesting about being an art historian is that there are very few parents who say, oh, they hold their baby in their arms and they look <laughs> at them and say, maybe they will become a doctor of art history one day. No one, no one says that. No one, no one's aspiring for the next art historian, right? So this is a path that um, belongs right now to a few, right? There's this, you, it's a world that's not um, very common at all. And yet, for those of you who have already been involved, it's this world that opens up so many opportunities to so many. Um, undergrads and graduates. I always, I've gotten into the habit now for the last three years of starting off with Toni Morrison. And so I will start there. <laughs> in the nation's 150th anniversary issue on March 23rd in 2015, Dr. Morrison published the article, No Place for Self-Pity, No Room for Fear. And in it, she starts off the article expressing her despondence over the 2004 re-election of George W. Bush that was paralyzing her from writing. A friend responded, no, 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 no. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. 
not when everything is fine, but in times of dread. That's our job. Morrison concludes the article with the following statement. No, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. And I know the world is bruised and bleeding and though it is important to not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom like art. And for me, I think that what becomes What's become sort of blatantly clear, I think, even in 2020, is just how much we need our artists among us to speak to the despair, the self pity, the silence, and or to break out of those things and um, to be bold and fearless. And I know what I sense from the AUC Art Collective, and I Apps, I brag about the art collective every chance I get because you all are doing such amazing work. Um, and I think you all are really on the pulse of what it means to be seen, to be heard, to be valued, to be loved within these environments, um, be it academic, uh, museum work, and um, art institutions writ large. And I think that the kind of love for the arts is really, um, it's being felt already. And, I, and it's clear in the students that um, you all gift us <laughs> in the world. I've had a chance to interact with um, some of the folks from the AUC Art Collective and most recently, or the last chance I had to do that was last year at the Clark Institute with Cheryl Finley and watching those students thrive um, was just amazing and holding their own with the grad students. No one would have imagined that they were grad, um, undergrads. So I think that's that I had to make sure I stated out loud that you are making all of us proud in the work that you're doing and you're only at the beginning and um, there is so much more ahead. Um, uh, three years ago, the um, Rutgers Newark opened up um, the Express Newark um, facility, downtown Newark a place where I, I mean, I have Newark imprinted on me, the walking downtown, taking the bus downtown, going to the stores there. And it was, um, this was probably one of the highest honors I've ever had um, outside the Biennale. I think this is feeling, that made me realize that being able to come home and be recognized was something else. But this space is really quite special in that it has a photo lab, um, printmaking studio. They revitalized this building, they installed a Whole Foods. Um, <laughs> but I think the work that the students are doing there, Jordan Castile is on the faculty there as well. Um, and it's just been a marvel to watch how people, um, how communities are coming together to create something new. And what I expressed then was, you know, that Newark was my home in the arts. And, you know, I do get this question of why did you become an art historian? What does our art historian do? But for me, I always note that it was the Newark Museum. And the Newark Museum for me was my own version of Disney World. I was very much um, attracted to that space. I enjoyed everything from looking at paintings. I used to have dreams about this Joseph Stella um, <laughs> actually, no, this was, I had, I remember the Joseph Stella, but I will show you a room that I did have dreams about um, later. They had so much available at the Newark Museum um, from Egyptian art to 
modern and contemporary art. And they also had live animals. They had jazz. They literally had a section where there, you, a room where you, there were animals, live animals. Um, and a planetarium, they still have the planetarium. So for me, my first experience with, with a museum was that it had everything. And you could go listen to music, you could see animals, you could look at paintings, you could take art classes. And um, this Ballantine House, if you've been to the Newark Museum, this I, this I used to have dreams, nightmares about, um, but you know, these installed places um, really did leave an impression on me. And, but what was really important about the Newark Museum for me was that it was free. And um, I grew up poor and being able to find places where you could learn and um, have a good time without spending a lot of money was critical. And so I, 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 and I know the museum world is sort of topsy-turvy right now, um, but being able to go to a place without worrying about whether you have access. And I think for me now in my career, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with access. And um, I should mention too that in 2009 under Krista Clark, um, she commissioned Yinka Shonabari to reinstall parts of the Ballantine House. And so having this experience as a young person going to places like the Ballantine House, um, that's the Ballantine beer family, and um, occupying that space and then going back years later and see it reoccupied with Shonabari's work. This is, you know, this to me feels right. Um, and I am forever changed by that. And just a little bit of background about um, my family. My parents moved to Newark from the Bronx and um, in the 70s. And my father was a full-time butcher. And um, even when we were moved to Newark, he continued to travel to the Bronx and then later in Newark. And my mother was a math teacher in New York City, um, also in the Bronx. And about seven years after the Newark riots, um, my family arrived there. And um, when I first drove around um, the city, my parents would point out to me where we used to live before moving to um, the, what was what's called the the colonnades, and um, I um, I'm named Nikki Green. I always have to say I'm a I'm a Black Arts Movement baby because I'm I'm named after Nikki Giovanni. Um, I grew up with another Nikki who was also named by <laughs> after Nikki Giovanni, and my brother's name was Baraka after Mary Baraka, and. Um, that's how Newark we are in terms of um, understanding our time there. And I had this wonderful opportunity to attend a charter school, it wasn't called a charter school, but it was, um, it's currently called the Link Community Charter School. And it was started by Jesuits who, um, whose church home was next door to the police station where the Newark riot started. And so going there in seventh and eighth grade was my kind of ticket of being able to be in this environment a small, of small classes, um, students of all um, academic levels and having opportunity to get to know um, no different aspects of the city of Newark, you know, going on field trips, and doing all kinds of research. Um, like one of our assignments was to find someone who was in Newark during the riots. And that was, that really had such an impact on me. And I will say that it feels almost treacherous or uh, treasonous, I should say, that I, after eighth grade, I went to boarding school um, as a way to uh, get a, 
better education. Um, and I was what for of a certain age, those who knew the facts of life, I was the 2D, I was Kim Fields, <laughs> one of very few black students in the school. I got a four year scholarship to go there, which was um, extraordinary and offered me um, this wonderful opportunity by my junior year to go abroad also on scholarship. And it was a big leap for me socioeconomically um, and educationally to go from Newark to Connecticut to Barcelona for a year and um, and having to go, you know, people ask you where you're from and you say, I'm from, I'm from Newark, New Jersey. Um, and then having people go, knowing that people have already, you say you're from a place, right? Be it Newark or Camden or Detroit or Chicago, um, Atlanta, people are automatically gonna have a sense of who you are by, by your geography. And I knew, and because it was sometimes expressed in coded language that, you know, oh, she's just a poor black kid. And um, being able to take that with me, I went through a phase where I'm like, I'm from New Jersey and I wouldn't say where, right? Because there's a, you feel ashamed from, of who you are. And then I said, no, I just say it from a chest and, um, and continue in that spirit that this poor black kid can do anything um, that she wants. And I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse here on the screen? But that's me, again, one of very few, <laughs> me with the other black student there for the um, year. And it that was really my entry into the art world. I took my first art history class. It was taught completely in Spanish. And um, so all of my vocabulary was in Spanish, which was strange. I had to kind of relearn the, um, the, the, the lingo of art history. And while it was a really fantastic place to be for a year and um, you know, within walking distance of the Picasso Museum, the school offered um, those of us who were on scholarship a, a chance to take a bus trip to Paris for um, the Easter break. And um, I, my commute was by some of the most famous Gaudi um, buildings. And I um, had a fantastic time. And also it was the first place where I was called the N word on the streets. Um, where I've had to, where I had to run away from skinheads um, and or you know neo-nazi groups and so it was a mixed bag but it it formed in me a, a sense of, of real desire to um, do what I need to do in this world and um, I fell in love with immediately fell in love with art history that year um, some scenes from Spain. Um, and because I wanted to learn Spanish, I knew very early I wanted to learn Spanish when I went to high school because growing up in Newark, I grew up with, um, with folks from Puerto Rico and I was fascinated by hearing people speak Spanish around me. And that kind of exposure to a language and learning, a la learning to speak a language fluently and then having the opportunity to go to Cuba. And I will say that going to Cuba was the first international location where I did not feel out of place. And I tend to pick up accents very easily. My mother's people are from North Carolina. So if I am in um, a southern place. I'll pick up a northern, uh, a southern accent, um, and I've been to Chile and Cuba, uh, as well as Spain, of course. And so when I was in Cuba, I picked up the Cuban accent, and people, I love that people. Are like, so where are you from? Like, what part of the island are you from? Are your parents from here? Are your grandparents? I was like, no, but that sense of belonging um, definitely I, it was just really amazing to me, and being able to see. 
um, contemporary artists at work. And this is where my love for, for Magda Campos Pons's work came into play, being a little groupie. Um, this is one of my former colleagues. She just retired now, um, filmmaker Salem Mikuria. I highly suggest that you um, look her up. Phen phenomenal film maker originally from um, Ethiopia. And so just this kind of exposure to the world really helped shape my um, global perspective. Uh, and in 2013, I was able to go um, with Salem Akuria's connections, go to, um, to Addis to teach art history. And I will have to say that when they initially said, yes, please come, I thought, okay, what would you like me to teach? Am I going to teach American art or your, you know, modern contemporary, you know, European, like, what do you, what do you want me to teach? And I was really, really struck that they really wanted me to teach about African art because all of the books that were, and I actually brought in my suitcases, a lot of books, um, but all books of African art and African diasporic art. And um, because as is the case, access to Western art is not a problem. And this idea that they could learn about other arts from the continent and um, outside of Ethiopia was really striking to me. And so, I had the chance to also meet some contemporary artists. Um, Elizabeth Wold is, was in DC for quite some time and is um, now in, based in Addis. And being able to go to her home, which was also her studio, to see how she works with glass, et cetera, was really, really um, also very formative. And I got a chance to spend time with the Netza Arts Village artists like Mirat Kebede. And she is, um, I think she's in Europe now. Um, all of these, I didn't put their Instagram handles, but all of their Instagrams uh, are available. Meeting these extraordinary artists who were able to establish this small arts village um, in Addis. And as you can see, reusing objects, um, everyday materials as a way of expressing themselves. I also had a wonderful opportunity to travel to Chile with my colleague, um, Daniela Rivera. And, um, and I actually presented on Renee Stout in Chile, which was awesome. And I, there was a um, translation provided for people that were there as well. And I think people are always, when I think about my job, and I'm sure you find this too, you have a passport to the world. And then you're in the classroom, you see it on the screen, but then when you're able to get out and actually see the things, it's really, really extraordinary. And being able to co-teach a class like the Global Americas at Wellesley College and traveling to Mexico in order to, for me to have a, a broader view of what Mexican art is like, as you can see there on the right, the, um, the home of Frida Kahlo, the um, Casa Azul there. Cheryl mentioned very briefly black portraitures and um, certainly in Florence, that was also very formative to be on this extraordinary panel. And that's one of the times that I was able to speak on Radcliffe Bailey's work. Um, I haven't published on Radcliffe yet. Everything, everything I wanna say, or a lot of what I wanna say is gonna be in the book, but um, Radcliffe is, for those of you who know his work and know him, he's also a very extraordinary artist. And I can't, I'm sure that um, Dr. Willis's name has come up quite a bit. And I consider Deb Willis, who is, um, and I've said this to her before in introductions, that she is, she's sort of everyone's mentor. We all stake our claim in her because she stakes a claim in us. And she really is such a supportive scholar and, the amount of 
belief she has in all of us is I, I sincerely want to model that kind of mentorship um, in the way that she's able to reach so many and guide so many, both art historians as well as artists. And so folks like Deb Willis um, has shaped photography, Black photography in, in extraordinary ways, um, of course. There is no Black photography history without Deb Willis. And then also this clearly, this is an um, old title. She is no longer associate. Um, and Kelly Jones as well has been really such a um, tremendous uh, scholar. I mean, my footnotes are full of Kelly's um, work. And so having these women in my life has has really been so extraordinary and um again black portraitures has been i think really so revolutionary in its access to international locations bringing um folks from around the world to talk about all kinds of things so when we were in johannesburg i talked about the sugar works of um Kara walker and magda Campos Pons. I also was able to be a moderator for these extraordinary artists, um, Kenyatta, Helena, Rochella, and um, Tiffany. I left Tiffany names, Tiffany's name off of there. And um, I am also in the process of developing a curator, doing curatorial work on performance art. And so these are some of the artists that I plan to include um, really as a result of this panel. I have to say too, what, what, what's been a, sort of a personal joy is the exposure it's given my family, my children in particular. They are much bigger than this now, um, but this is my daughter and son. When we went to Johannesburg, being able to take them places that I could have only dreamed of going previously that has been a joy. And having my now 10 year old boy and 13 year old girl who is basically, who is gaining on me and just a couple of inches shorter than me now and I'm 5'10". So <laughs> um, it's been extraordinary to take this journey with them. And so as I think about taking Newark with me, um, I'm taking my family with me, I'm taking my students with me as often as possible. I wanted to mention this extraordinary uh, time that I had that's closer to your age, um, which was uh, in between high school and college. I was a National Smithsonian High School intern with these extraordinary women. Back in 93, you were able to just walk into the House of Representatives unannounced and see if your representative was there. And so, um, Asha Jackson, we all, we actually just had a um, Zoom call this week. Asha Jackson is on the uh, left here. And this is Shauna Basenti, Allison Basenti. And of course, being able to walk into John Lewis's office, literally unannounced, just said we had our Smithsonian badges, right? We're from the Smithsonian. And he came right out, like literally walked out of his office to greet us. And what an extraordinary spirit and um, so grateful for the time that he took for with us. And what I've been also, you know, the kind of good trouble that we've been able to get into since that summer, we spent six to eight weeks together and to watch our journeys separately. Um, for those of you who are in Atlanta, you may have come across the Honorable Asha Jackson. She's the Chief Superior Court Judge in DeKalb County. And uh, my dear friend, Shauna Allison Vicente is the head of school at Navajo Prep. Uh, Asha had an internship at Anacostia Museum that summer. And Shauna had an internship at the um, American Indian Museum before the museum was built. We're middle-aged, some time has passed. I'm gonna kind of skip through a little bit, but again, this kind of generational um, impact 
of the intersection of my life as a high school. I was 17 years old that summer. And to be able to introduce my children to John Lewis on Martha's Vineyard, actually Cheryl was with us that day um, with her daughter, Nora. I remember that. Yeah, yes, it was a great time. Um, that's me on the left when I graduated from Wesleyan. That's me on the right when I graduated with my PhD with when my daughter was just two. And um, with my husband, oh, my husband, Simeon there. And then also, some of you ha may have come across this article of, you know, these spaces that we begin to enter. Um, living in Wellesley has been uh, something else. It's a it's a one percenter kind of place. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. Um, but in that, I talk about being approached in my children basically being petted um, and understanding that that kind of interaction has an impact and that I have to take into account these experiences of my children as well. And um, knowing that the life that I live as an art historian and as someone who is interested in documenting black life, that I have to be about that life and defending my children and writing for them and being for them. Um, and I'm looking at the time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip through just a little bit. Um, I've been very interested in how social media really works. Um, I've gotten a little bit, I have social media in 2020 is tough. I do what I can, but um, it really has been something that I've been interested in as I think about how social media really sparked the Black Lives Matter movement and then thinking about what it would mean for my son to also understand his place in its history. Um, and I do, and it's a part of my pedagogy. I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna get back to it a little bit more again this year has been, it's been tougher to do so. Um, oh, hold We're on. not just learning about. And so in thinking about accessibility, I'm just gonna sh show this quick clip um, and of my, introduction to art history that, you know, these admissions videos um, to give you a sense of how I think about teaching. And I will show maybe one or two more slides. And if you have any questions for me, please, please ask. So there's a lot that I've um, left out of my journey for sure. Art is not just about dates or images or names. It's more about almost a way to look at the world and a, a way to look at culture. It's super complex and it's very challenging. You're reading things that you would usually do in graduate school. So the class really is about finding ways to interpret the world, cultures across time. Talked about maps. We've talked about commodity. Right now we're talking about style. Helping us reach a full analysis by giving us historical context, by giving us cultural context, and by giving us thematic context challenging the way the world is subjectively viewed from one person to the next. For me, it's just been really disassembling how I've looked at things before and making me look at them in a new light. I'm going to take apart this thing so I can really know its function and its use. I never thought about who made this, why did they make this, what were their intentions. The knowledge is just immediately applicable to everyday life. They go out with a sense that I can go anywhere in the world and have a different understanding and a different perspective. As a result, they have something to add to that world. Introducing my students to folks like Kimberly Drew, who's also from New Jersey. And um, I met Kimberly Drew. I know a lot of you know her and she has this great new book coming out or just out with Jenna Wortham, um, The Black Art Futures. And I think I got that title right. <laughs> and, um, and 
to see again, I met, I met Kimberly when she was in, as an undergrad at Smith, when she had just started her Tumblr and um, was, you know, where you all are right now, where most of you are in kind of developing as, a, as an art historian, burgeoning art historian, and to see the impact that she's had on the world has really been so fantastic to witness. Um, as I mentioned, my book on Renee Stout and Magda Campos Pons and Radcliffe Bailey will be coming out soon. I wish I had time to talk a little bit more about it, but you'll just have to trust me that when I talk about um, the ways in which the sonic interconnect with the visual, I do it with, for example, with the funk rocker Betty Davis and the work of Renee Stout. Um, and thinking about what I've called the feminist funk power, the way in which uh, Magda is able to create these um, performances that involve Afro-Cuban drummers and musicians and um, recitation and dance and movement through all kinds of spaces, including the Guggenheim, where she shows up as the Guggenheim, a Black woman embodying the Guggenheim. And so, oh, oh so impressive. And then also, of course, Radcliffe Bailey and installations like Windward Coast that was installed at um, the Davis Museum at Wellesley College and being able to kind of think about what does it mean for there to be a kind of shine and aesthetic along the lines of what Krista Thompson talks about in her book um, called Shine. and with these disassembled piano keys, how can we think of a kind of phenomenological experience of sound and the visual operating often at the same time? So what I'll do now is just mention that, of, Cheryl mentioned that I'm the visual arts editor of Transition and um, our next issue that we'll be working on is of uh, Cuban artists, or I work on the art, they work on the literary stuff, but it's gonna be on Afro-Cuba. And probably the most, what has been um, my most recent essay on Thomas McKellar, uh, the model for John Singer Sargent held a lot of, um, holds a special place in my heart. And I just want to mention, oops, that um, I will be giving, I will be in conversation with the very, um, your very own Myra Green from Spelman College on November 12th as part of a series called Handmade Photography Today with the Davis Museum at Wellesley College. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you for your attention. Um, uh, I, I should mention the Biennale. One of the ways that um, I have been able to be involved with this is that I've really made it my MO when I, to get to know area museums. When I was at the University of Delaware as a graduate, I spent a lot of time, I guess I can, let me stop sharing this for a second. I was able to, um, get to know the Philadelphia Museum art world. And I, believe I have a show that will be mounted in the spring of 2022 on um, Mo Brooker, who is an abstractionist. And then, um, so being in the Boston area, being able to get to know the communities like the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, as well as the ICA. And so I was really humbled to be able to be a part of the application process and I will be working primarily on um, the educational and programming aspects of the 59th Venice Biennale supporting Simone Lee's work and installation in the American Pavilion. And so that will entail um, getting to know some of you here. And um, I'm, I'm really, really excited about the partnership with the AUC Art Collective. So, if you have any questions for me, please do go ahead, shoot them my way. Um, very interested in, in hearing more from you all. Oh, hi, Ming. <laughs> I saw Ming last year, met Ming last year. 
Hi, Dr. Green. <laughs> Good to I see you. Same yeah. to you. I have a question regarding um, how you approach curating performance art and then if your writing on performance art differs from your um, other approach to writing on visual arts. Oh, I, I have been writing about music and art since I was an undergrad. My, my undergrad thesis was on Aaron Douglas and um, the aspects of Negro Life series and how music comes through. So I've, I've always approached art history as an interdisciplinary form. I, I, I could never separate out the music, the dancing, whatever form of art I can. So for me, it's, it's always already interconnected. So for performance, um, I had a chance to write about Magda's performances and I write specifically about um, the Habla La Madre performance at the Guggenheim, the performance at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts and identified at the National Portrait Gallery. So writing about performance is, it just allows me one, one more dimension. So if I'm thinking about what the visual represents, right, whether it's two dimensional or three dimensional, and then I think about how the sonic operates where it's, it's not always, it's not as fixed, right? It can be either an intimation of sound, right? If you see someone, see a musician depicted in an, uh, a, a painting or collage, I worked, I wrote a lot about Romare Bearden um, as part of my master's thesis and, and, and uh, dissertation. So what I see performance allowing me to do is to just go one more space forward to add this, the, the way in which performance can reach audiences in a very different way. I love the whole, I've, I've written about jazz um, early on with Romare Bearden. So for me, that kind of the improvisation that extends from an understanding of how jazz music is performed to seeing uh, collage come together in terms of its pro improvisation and by, in the works of Romare Bearden. And now in thinking about how the body operates, I teach a seminar called The Body, Race and Gender in Contemporary Art. For me, it just allows me one more step, one more way to incorporate um, what I, what, I mean, the term of phenomenology, this idea that there is sort of different phenomena happening at once. That's not all, you can't always put your finger on it, but for me, it just, it's opening things up. So with this show, what I'm hoping to do is it won't be fixed, right? They'll have, of course, all of these artists are multimedia artists, but being able to also come up with a performance program is um, gonna be really special for me. And working with contemporary artists is just a lot of fun because they're constantly creating new things. It's also hard because they're also always creating new things. <laughs> so that's how I, I just see it as an extension of, of what I already do. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. I have some extraordinary pictures of Ming performing her, her um, prose in, in front of Titus Kaffer. I have to put something together to send to you all, but Ming, you left such a powerful impression on all of us, so. Thank you, that's very touching. Are there any other questions for me? Oh yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm Kamaya. I'm a junior at Spelman College, art history major and curatorial studies minor. So I'm a part of the entire program. Um, and I had interest in your studies in Ethiopia and maybe what your, I guess your emphasis on African art was and if there was any I guess, relation to maybe feminist theory in African art or like, what was your focus? Thank you. So yes, thank you for that question. So when I was in Ethiopia, I taught basically a series of about five lectures and um, 
and honestly, it was it was just an a broad overview of where I specialize is in Western and Central cultures of Africa, and primarily as an expression of the ways in which religion and artistic production um, extended from the transatlantic slave trade. And so I didn't have a chance. I was, I was there as a student of Ethiopian art. And um, so there wasn't, I, I'm, I, I did get into some of those umbrella ideas of, of, of female artists, folks like Sakari Douglas Camp, who's originally from um, Southern Nigeria and, um, but based in London. So being able to introduce them to folks like her, that that's who immediately comes to mind as standing out. Um, but most of that, that the conversation surrounding things like feminist, feminist um, art practice, post-coloniality, those conversations sort of took place outside of the lecture form. It was in the time spent with all of those artists, really. Um, so yeah, my focus in my in in teaching there was on Western and Central African art primarily. Thank you. Welcome. I should mention in that video, one of my former students, Jordan Mayfield, um, was a spent a semester at Spelman as her as her abroad stay and right when the curatorial program was starting and she was able to sit in on a couple of classes. She had an extraordinary time and she's now in her second year of graduate school at Columbia University in art history. So, so thank you for the impact you had on, on Jordan. She's an extraordinary scholar. Thank you, Dr. Green. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm looking at the time and I know we're we're coming to the end uh, and the top of the hour. Are there any other questions uh, from, from students? We really enjoyed your presentation and I, I just want to say and, and echo I think from all of us here um, at the AUCR Collective that you really set um, a memorable and inspiring, yes, Janiyah, um, inspiring example for us all, you know, and, and the way that you've been able to situate your presentation for us today within your family's experience, beginning with your naming, beginning with your parents, um, but also filtered through your own family, um, I think is a really great example for us all. Um, you know, at some point when we finish our undergraduate studies, we'll go on to study elsewhere, we'll go on to get jobs and go on to have other experiences, including families of our own. And um, it is truly the kind of uh, uh, discipline one can be engaged in as a lifelong learner with their family members. And, and like you um, and many of us who are sort of administering the program at the AUC, we believe firmly in field study. We believe firmly in how um, local, national and global experiences can help us to expand our understanding of the discipline and to make a difference in the world. And your example for us today is just, you know, extraordinary. And we just want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Would I, can you mind if I say one more thing? Oh, please. Um, to the student. Um, I've already expressed just how impressed I am with you all. Um, this, you all are, you all, are already amazing. You are already important in the conversations that we have. And you are going to have doubts about whether this is the right path. It's inevitable. I have doubts still. Like, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this in 2020? Is this important? <laughs> You know, and go back to Toni Morrison, right? Exactly. We 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 are healing civilizations right now, and I just want you to know 
that you belong. You, I need you. We need you. And I am so grateful that you all are taking this particular journey and that you are being, I, I, I know that it's, you might be bucking against some family members who are like, well, wait, wait, wait. You're going to college for art history now or curatorial studies, right? And you have a vision and that, that please, please, I had that gut feeling of like, I think this is what I need to do. I was supposed to be a psych and Spanish double major. <laughs> that was what I was supposed to do, become a psychologist, and do the work, but please trust your gut and please show up as your authentic selves. Do not change who you are. Don't, you don't have to change how you speak. You don't have to change how you dress because these institutions need you more than you need them. And please, please, please trust with the army of people that we have, you know, I'm mentioning Deb Willis, and, um, and Kelly Jones. But like I said, I met Ming Washington a year ago. You think I don't, I'm not gonna remember that? So when Ming comes through and Janiah comes through and Jordan comes through and Neil comes through and Zoe comes through, you don't, and you tell me, oh, I, I, you know, I was a part of this program. We got you, you know what I mean? You are, you are so important to us. And you make my job worth doing. You are making us proud right now, not in the future when you get the degrees and you're making us proud right now. You make me proud right now. I am so proud of you all. And I hope you really feel that. I brag to my department at Wellesley College. I'm like, y'all need to, I'm sending them Instagram. I'm like, you need to see what they are doing. And we well, need to- Well, you know, Nikki, I. I, I want to say, um, I hope that this is the beginning of a, you know, a long partnership, actually, you know, that can, can extend beyond um, whatever happens in the next year and a half, but between our two institutions um, through exchange. And, um, and, and I think that everyone in our program from students who are taking classes and enrolled and who have specifically sought this program out um, even before they were matriculated as students. And I'll, I'll say Neil's part of that bunch. Um, but we're, we are, we are proud of you from the very beginning, um, from the very beginning. And so many of you are already so well far advanced and attuned to um, what's going on in the world and what needs to change um, in the world of art. And we take your lead um, I think just one other thing I would add, and you mentioned this in the beginning, Dr. Green, that when we were um, at the Clark Art Institute last fall in November um, with uh, two students from, from our program, um, as you said, you know, they, they were outspoken. They knew that they belonged there and they, they walked in and took a seat at a table yes. in a small cramped conference room with about what, 25, 30 people, and all of the graduate students who were well beyond uh, their years, they were huddled in a corner and, and did Afraid. not even speak up until one of us, I think it was Dr. Willis, turned around and said, well, how come you all aren't saying anything? And they were, they were told and made to feel that they, they did not have the right to have a seat at the table. And so, um, right. yeah. I think, I think they know, you know. Grab your seat at the table, y'all. That's exactly what they did. They sat at the table and you belong. You, you have, listen, the rooms that I'm in, that Cheryl's in, you are at the table. Okay. You hear that, Elizabeth? Ahmed, I don't know if it's Christian or Christian, Maxime, I see y'all and everybody else on YouTube. I think that y'all already 
have, y'all already, y'all walk into those rooms like you belong at the table because you do. They may not know it, but you do. You do. You own that space. It makes a I huge a, difference. A, excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Denaya. Um, I was wondering, um, do we have access to your contact information? Or is that something that we should ask for through Rachel or Lauren? Um, please, please contact me. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Nikki G PhD, and you can email me at n green g r e e n e at wellesley.edu any time. I I'm gonna write it in here. I might not be very good about getting back to you right now because um, I only have so much space in my head, but. Um, Please, please be in touch. If you're ever in the Northeast, if you're ever in the Boston area, I, I will be mad if you don't like reach out and I find out you were in DC. I mean, you were in um, Boston and I didn't, I didn't know. Okay, please. I welcome, I welcome conversation, um, but I will be in touch because I will be in touch with you all as we get closer to the Biennale. So we'll be in more conversations together. Beautiful. Finish, Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all so much.